once again, Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world. This is our special episode number 34 as the last final warning message just prior to the close of the week. Now, I would like to read PTG number 2, page 20. PTG number 2, page 20. Well, I for one do not question anything God has spoken through his prophets. I know that he does not lie, that he is well able to direct the writings of his prophets, that he makes no vain promises, that he is able to fulfill all his days, that his prophecies never fail. I take the promises of rebuke as readily as the promises of commendation. I study my duties as laid down by him with as great pleasure as I study the promises of glory. OTG number 2, page 20. Now I would like to read this reading in the writings of Alonso Jones. Let me read you. He says here, It is important, therefore, it is important, therefore, for us to study the prophecy and see what it says, and as much as possible, what it does not say. So I would like to read again. It is important, therefore, for us to study the prophecy and see what it says, and as much as possible, what it does not say. So, there are two things mentioned in the reading that we need to study in sincerity the prophecy and see what it says. And as much as possible, we need to study those things by which the prophecy does not say. Now, for example, I would like to cite this example in 12 Symbolic Code, number 6 and 7, page 7. 12 Symbolic Code, number 6 and 7, page 7. Those some may understand that the church was to be in the wilderness only for the duration of the prophetic 1,260 days, it should be pointed out that Revelation does not say that. The Revelation only says that the woman was to be fed in the wilderness 1,260 days. It does not say how long she would be there. From Symbolic Code 6 and 7, page 7. So, it says, it should be pointed out that the Revelation does not say that. So, we need to study the prophecy, what it does say, and also as much as possible, we need to study what it does not say. And that is why we need to be very careful in studying the, the prophecy. And most important of all, to always remember that we need to distinctly separate the false expectation of the prophets and the biblical truth. So let us read again the statement. The old symbolic code. 7 symbolic code 7 to 12 page 19. We have learned much and no doubt there is much more for us to learn. It is the follow on and the go through spirit that will finally land the remnant without fault in the heavenly Mount Zion. My conclusion is that we should give up no scripture truth but that our false applications and interpretations of scripture and consequent false ideas of order and propriety should be given up as fast as possible. The Review on Herald, May 29, 1860. So, we need to distinctly separate the, the false expectation of the prophet and the scriptural truth. Because in our study, the false expectation of the prophet is allowed by God and it is represented by the cow's dung, as stated in 1SR, page 124. So, let us now uh, proceed to our study, boys and sisters. I would like to um, read that statement on um, timely greetings by which in 1 TG 29, 1 TG 29 page 8, uh, page 9 rather, 1 TG 29 page 9, it says, The answer to all these questions is simply this. There must be an awakening to spiritual poverty and earnestness in searching truth. So, there are two periods of time predicted beforehand, awakening of spiritual poverty. First, pertaining to the righteous, they will be awakened to their spiritual poverty while provision still lingers. Whereas the wicked, they will be awakened to their spiritual poverty when probation closes. Now, for example, this reading in 2TG number 24, on page 23, it says, The church, therefore, will not sleep forever. The true people of God will awake to their poverty. What poverty? Spiritual poverty. And who are they that will be awakened to their spiritual poverty? The true people of God. And it must be during provisionary time. And without any doubt, the true people of God mentioned here is the 144,000 leading saints. All of them will be awakened to their poverty. And what poverty? Spiritual poverty. 
So concerning spiritual aspect, what is the only riches? Present truth. Without the present truth, we are in deep spiritual poverty. The mere fact that the true people of God will be awakened to their spiritual poverty indicates that they discovered that the present truth were not in their borders and they will awaken to that absolute fact, um, spiritual poverty. And that is only pointing to the true people of God. So I would like to read again in 1 TG 29, page 9. The answer to all these questions is simply this. There must be an awakening to spiritual poverty, an earnestness in searching truth. And to repeat again, that must be pointing to the people of God, the true people of God. I remember in 1 TG 27, page 6 and 7, 1 TG 27, page 6 and 7, it says, From these verses, it is apparent that the unfoldment of these scriptures brings a revival and reformation among God's people, such as the world has never seen. Those who receive the truth in its fullness, you see, those who receive the truth in its fullness, Humbly confess that they are sinners and that they wish to know the worst of their case. They gladly sacrifice anything and everything. To them, no sacrifice is too great that would bring them closer to the Lord. As soon as their pride of opinion leaves them, as soon as they humbly inquire how to come and bow before the Lord, just that soon the answer comes to them. So it says, as soon as their pride of opinion leaves them, so that is one of the greatest miracles that God's people will leave completely their pride of opinion. In 2 TG number 19, page 10 and 11, 2 TG number 19, page 10 and 11, it says, When will this be? It will have to be just as soon as God can get a company of people to see eye to eye, Isaiah 52 verse 8, that their own so-called good deeds are but filthy rugs and thus be of one accord. The only such company in prophecy you know is of the, is the 144,000. The first puts the servants of God who stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb without guile in their mouth. Revelation 14 verse 1, verse 4 and 5. To achieve such a happy, holy state, the church must experience a mighty revival and reformation, a shaking, a shifting, such as she has never yet experienced. Yes, if everyone were to cast away his private ideas and opinions, it would indeed bring the greatest revival and reformation since the day of Pentecost. 2 TG number 19, pages 10 and page 11. It says, at the time when pointing to the entire constituent of the 144,000 living saints, all of them cast away their private ideas and opinions. That is the time by which such projected events, the greatest revival and reformation, will be launched since the day of Pentecost. Remember, in Desire of Ages, on page 280, it says here, uh, Desire of Ages, page 280, it was this that proved the ruin of the Jews. It will prove the ruin of many souls in our day. Thousands are making the same mistake as did the Pharisees whom Christ reproved at Matthew's feast. Rather than give up some cherished idea or discard some idol of opinion, many refuse the truth which comes down from the Father of life. They trust in self and depend upon their own wisdom and do not realize their spiritual poverty. They insist on being saved in some way by which they may perform some important work. When they see that there is no way of weaving self into the work, they reject the salvation provided. Desire of Ages, page 280. Now let us read the statement again here in 1 TG number 29 and 9. It says, the answer to all these questions is simply this. There must be an awakening to spiritual poverty and earnestness in searching truth. There must be a stop to sin. There must be a sinless place and people, an ark of safety, so to speak, if we are ever to be saved from the plagues. Then it says, Achan's too must be put away before Israel can triumph and take the land. God in his wisdom knows that it is better to destroy comparatively few enemies of truth than to lose the whole world. All the stumbling blocks must be removed. The main subject here is Achan. It says Achan's too must be put away before Israel can triumph and take the land. And who are they? The Achan's of today. So it's very important to understand who are they? The antitypical Achan's that God would, would remove them before God's people can, can triumph. 
Now here in track number 4, let's read page 43. Track number 4, page 43. Achan's taking the Lord's money represents that class of church members who covet the silver and the gold which has set apart for himself and who thereby rob him of that which is his own tithes and offerings. So who are they, the Achan's? They are those who rob him by tithes and offerings. And let us now study closely, brothers and sisters, uh, this represented by Athens. The, the statement used in the Bible for prophecy is rob, robbery. And according to 2TG number, uh, let's read the statement, 2TG number 30, page 17, it says, These verses, that is Malachi 3, verse 6 to 9, these verses do not blame the, individu the individual members of the church for robbing the Lord, but the whole denomination, the whole nation. So the robbery here is not individual, but it is the, the whole nation. Why? Because the individual are faithfully giving their tithes and offerings. But according to the shepherd's rod, they brought their tithes and offerings to the treasury, which is not recognized by God as he is. Now let us read in 2 TG number 30, page 18. Where is one to look for God's storehouse? So it says here, where is one to look for God's storehouse? Wherever God's truth is for today, from wherever meat in due season is dispensed. The statement, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, implies that some are already bringing into it, but not all. This along with the charge that the whole nation is robbing God, positively shows that the tithes are now brought not to God's storehouse, but to some other house. To repeat, God's storehouse has ever been and ever will be where the message of the hour is, where the present truth is, the house from which meat in due season is dispensed at the time the tithes are paid. 2 TG number 30, page 18. So that is um, the statement, very plain, given by the shepherd's word. Now, I want to read this reading in track number 4. It says here, track number 4 on page 43 and page 44. Let's read the statement given by the shepherd's wife. It says, The tithes and the offerings are of the Lord's substance, and those who think that they can so manipulate them as to accomplish whatever end is desired are deceiving themselves, not God. For his command is, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Malachi 3 verse 10. The storehouse is the only place designated where one may bring the tithes and offerings and unload from his shoulders the heavy responsibility which a faithful stewardship imposes. To do otherwise with them is to leave one's account in the heavenly ledger, standing in the red, even though one may appropriate them to some meritorious work of charity where it is yet today. Therefore, flee from this sin of Achan's before it is forever too late. As I live, as I live, saith the Lord, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel 33 verse 11. Now here's another statement that I would like to read to you. And uh, volume 6, Stimonis for the Church, on page 15. So I would like to read. The heavenly watchers, volume 6, page 15. It says, the heavenly watchers see the earth filled with violence and crime. Wealth is obtained by every species of robbery. Not robbery of men only, but of God. And we know that the only robbery of God is tithes and offerings. Now, I would like to read again the statement here. Uh, volume 6, page 15. The heavenly watchers see the earth filled with violence and crime. Wealth is obtained by every species of robbery. Not robbery of men only, but of God. Men are using his means. So there are many people using God's money to gratify their selfishness. Everything they can grasp is made to minister to their greed. Avarice and sensuality prevail. Men cherish the attributes of the first great deceiver. They have accepted him as God and have become imbued with his, his spirit. I would like to read one to you. Number 18, 1 TG number 18, on page 17. What a fearful responsibility rests upon those who carelessly handle the word of God, who pose as sole guardians over the people, but who in reality are guarding that no soul escape landing in hell. Both they and their abominations will fall in the ditch. 
Indeed, if any reform is needed in Christendom, it is certainly needed worse in this one line. So what a fearful responsibility rests upon those who carelessly handle the word of God and who pose as sole guardians over the people, but who in reality are guarding that no soul escape landing in hell. Because supposed to be, if you are a shepherd, you need to guide the people to accept the truth. But that is always the opposite. Those who are in the leadership, they are the very ones who hinder the message, uh, brothers and sisters. So, in this study, it is a warning message to all. Before everything is too late, we should not follow the attitude of Achan that he confessed when everything is too late. So, while provisionary time still lingers, we need to listen to, to the message. This last final uh, warning message. Now, I would like to read a statement in 2SR, page 100 and page 101. It says, If God's ideal is to bless the world through the medium of His church on earth, and they to whom the gospel for the world is committed have left the ship and are serving the devil in the person of themselves, where is the hope of the world? Where is the hope of the world? The only answer that can be given is, Woe to the sinners in Zion. God will gather His sheep. He will have a church, but what will be the reward of those who were instructed to feed the lambs and are feeding themselves? Christ who sees the end from the beginning and with his all-seeing eye focus on present-day condition has said, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them in meat in due season? Of course, the only hope of the world is the gospel. But what if, if the church by which unto them was committed the gospel, have left the ship and are serving the devil in the person of themselves. The question is, where is the hope of the world? The answer is, God church. It says, he will have a church. So this reading in 2SR 100 and 101, the only hope of the world is that church promised by God that it says, he will have a church by which God will gather his ship. I would like to read 1 PG number 45 on page 20. 1 TG number 45, page 20. That shepherds are slain because they have kept the ship, because they have kept the ship away from the Lord's green pasture, present truth. I would like to read again 1 TG 45, page 20. That shepherds are slain. Why? Because they have kept the ship away from the Lord's green pasture, present truth. Of course, the word shepherds, that is the people who are in the leadership. Why is it that they are slain? Because instead of leading God's people to accept the present truth, they kept away the people of God to access with the present truth. They were the one hindering so that the true people of God will not listen to the present truth. But brethren, you cannot deceive God's people forever. And what we are doing is only a condemnation upon ourselves. So I would like to read again the statement on answerer number four. It says here in answerer number 4 on page 23, that whoever continues to hold his people in bandage and in ignorance of his truth, will he tread in his anger and trample them in his fury and sprinkle their blood upon his garments, thereby staining all his raiment and thus setting his people free. Or in other words, there is a boundary line. What is the statement in 2SR 101? The only answer that can be given is, Woe to the sinners in Zion. What is Zion? Palace grounds. Headquarters, White House recruiter on page 53. It says, And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion at headquarters, What is Zion? Represents headquarters. And where is the place by which the headquarters can be found? There is only one place by which the trees naturally grow. It is in the symbolical earth, according to track number 8, page 24. And you know this paragraph had been grossly misconstrued by many the Bible. When they read this paragraph, the only reason that they read because they want to lift up their headquarters. And it says in track number 8, page 24, it is located to John in the symbol of the Tohon Beast coming up 
not out of the sea, but out of the earth. Revelation 13, 11. The only place where trees naturally grow. The only place by which trees naturally grow. And what is represented by the trees? Leadership, headquarters, it says, and as according to Daniel 4, verse 20 to 22, trees are figurative of rulers. Therefore, the trees in this instance represent the ancient men before the house, Ezekiel 9, verse 6. A fact which reveals that in this period, the church headquarters are in the two-horned beast dominion, the new world, the earth. So, the trees represent headquarters. And the only place by which the trees naturally grow is in the symbolical earth. And that is pointing to the United States of America. Now, let me read to you timely greetings. Timely greetings number uh, 1TG number 9 on page 5. 1TG number 9, page 5. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Then it says 1TG number 9, page 5. He shall save the tents the humble dwellings rather than the houses or palaces. Who are they? Represented by Judah. They are the people by which what they had is only tents. They have no houses. They have no palaces. What is houses and palaces? Headquarters. So whoever this antitypical Judah in this prophecy is very plain. That these people, they have no houses. They have no palaces. And to repeat again, palaces. Palace ground represent headquarters. Zion represent palace grounds. Headquarters. So let us read again the statement here in 1 TG number 9, page 5. He shall save the tents, the humble dwellings, rather than the houses or palaces. Of Judah first, that is the Lord, is to save first the common people, the lighty, so that the ministry may not exalt themselves above the lighty, that all may learn to give glory to God, not to any man. Now, let us analyze closely, brothers and sisters, the statement given in the Bible, in the parable of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 20, in Jesus, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 6. Matthew 20, verse 6. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle, and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They said unto him, Because no man hath heard us, he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So that is very plain. What is the eleventh hour servants? They stand all the day standing idle. Brothers and sisters, I would like to repeat again that according to the shepherd's rod, the truth of the parable in Matthew 20 has never been understood by any other company except the eleventh hour. 2SR 234. 2SR page 234. It says, But the object of the lesson is for the latter, who are hard at the eleventh hour, for the truth of the parable has never been understood by any other company. 2SR 234. So whatever the truth concerning the parable in Matthew 20, never been understood by any other company, and only the eleventh hour servants. And we know that the 11 hour servants represents the 144,000. Represent the 144,000. White House recruiter on page 28, he says, Hence it is to be proclaimed by guileless servants, the 144,000, the servants of the 11th hour. The servants of the 11th hour. So that is very plain, brothers and sisters. Now, since Matthew chapter 20, in that parable, only the 144,000 have been able to understand. Why? Because understanding comes only from Jesus Christ. And the only reason that it is the 144,000 understood the parable in Matthew 20, it's so because Jesus Christ did not unfold such truth to any of them who experienced grave and resurrection, but only to the 144,000 living souls. And the same with the statement in 1 SR page 13. It is because it was not present truth in their time. I would like to quote again that statement in 2 SR 118 saying, This grammatical rule is observed in the scriptures and it is one way to recognize present truth. 2 SR 118. And it is even more definitely applied to the Bible. That is why in 2 SR page 18, in 2 SR page 18, it says, One of the chief reasons why confusion arises? Uh, why confusion arises among Bible students? So I would like to read again. One of the chief reasons why confusion arises among Bible students is because they do not entirely depend 
on the biblical expression of the words. They think themselves wiser than the prophets who were inspired with the Spirit of God and thus wish to correct the words and meaning of the Holy Bible. Hence, finite mortals have attempted to rectify and correct the infinite one whose wisdom, power, and vision is unsearchable. So that reading is very plain that we need to depend entirely on the biblical expression of the words in the Bible because God is infallible God. 1 is R 232. And His works always spell, per spell perfection even to one jot or one detail. Now look at the, the biblical expression given in the Bible. I would like to read the statement. It says, and it is Jesus Christ who said it. Matthew 20 verse 6. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? Remember, it says all the day. That is the biblical expression given in the Bible. It did not say half, but all the day they were standing idle. Who are they? The 144,000. So that is one of the experience that all of them have the same experience. All the day, they were standing idle. Now, it is not pointing to secular job or whatever it is that the 144,000 are doing nothing because they were industrious people. They were not lazy. But what the Bible is saying that all of them within that, all the day, all of them, brothers and sisters, of course, it is pointing to the gospel ministry. So the entire 144,000, there must be a specific period of time by which in that time, all the day, the entire daylight, they were not, uh, how we call that one, supported by the tithes. Because they said, no man hath hired us. What is their answer? It says, they said unto him, because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. But the parable is very plain. The entire constituent of the 144,000, they were standing idle all the day. Who said that? Jesus Christ. Now, I would like to read Whitehouse uh, Recruiter on page 17. Whitehouse Recruiter, page 17. He says, Having thus my first call for servants so let be established the time in which the parabolical go to work calls started. We are now to ascertain the call time and the work period. So let us distinctly separate the call time and the work period. How many hours does the hundred forty four thousand work? Only one hour. How many hours that by which they were standing idle? Twelve hours all the day they were standing idle. I would like to repeat again because we need to strictly observe the biblical expression given in the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, Why stand ye here all the day idle? Now, B.T. Hotep says, I would like to read to you, 2SR 222. It says, uh, given by the voice of inspiration. Note that the barley is but one third the price of the wheat. In other words, one goes into the field and gathers only one measure of wheat and receives a full day's pay. But the other who works all day gathers three measures of barley and receives no more than a day wage, a penny. The symbols have a very close connection with the parable given by Christ. You see? The symbols have a very close connection with the parable given by Christ. Therefore, let the reader concentrate on the subject, for here is a truth worth our earnest attention. So, that is very plain. The, the vision of John in Revelation 6 verse 6 has a close connection with the parable given by Christ. And it says, therefore, let the readers concentrate on the subject, for here is a truth worth our earnest attention. And the only way that you can explain Matthew 20, verse 6 and 7, is to connect Revelation 6, verse 6, as stated by the shepherd's rod, because Revelation 6, verse 6, has a close connection with the parable given by Christ in Matthew 20. Now, let us read uh, 2SR 225. It says, With the previous explanation of Revelation 6, verse 6, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, 
we shall endeavor to prove that the symbols point back to the parable of the householder. And Jesus allegorically looked forward to John's vision. If the explanation perfectly fits the parable and the vision, I would like to read again the statement. If the explanation perfectly fits the parable and the vision, in harmony with God's book and law, and a present truth lesson is derived therefrom, then only must we accept it as truth. Now, the explanation should perfectly fit the parable. What parable? The parable in Matthew 20 concerning the five distinct posts. Perfectly fits the parable and the vision. What vision? The vision in Revelation 6 verse 6. And we already read that it has close connection with its other. Now, let us go back to 2SR 222. At 2SR 2 page 222. It says, In our study of the seven seals, we reserve for future explanation the following scripture. And I heard a voice in the midst of the poor beast say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. Revelation 6 verse 6. Again, we turn the reader's attention to the fact that the voice came from the throne. See chapter 5 verse 11. Therefore, the price of the cereals is fixed by the great judge. There must be something of great importance in these symbols for the great Jehovah himself is speaking. Now, let us ponder deeply, brothers and sisters. And according to the shepherd's rod, we need to concentrate brothers and sisters, to the parable and the vision in Revelation 6, verse 6. Now, let us concentrate on that subject. I would like to read again. Matthew 20, uh, verse 6 and verse 7. It says, And about the eleventh hour, so the statement about the eleventh hour, we do not know. Um, oh, it did not flatly say how many minutes before the eleventh hour will arrive. Because the statement, and about the 11th hour. So, indicating that the 11th hour did not as yet arrive. But about, almost, it says, And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle, and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? Now, I would like to make an illustration so that we could understand. Now, the voice of inspiration says that, the place by which they were standing idle is in the marketplace. Right? Now, for example, this is the marketplace. So these people were standing idle. How many hours? All the day. If you will say all the day, that must be from 6 a.m. all the daylight to 6 p.m. That is the entire day. All the day, all the daylight. They were standing idle. But the verse itself is puzzling. How could you say that they were standing all the day when the householder came to them about the 11th hour? About the 11th hour. So, about the 11th hour. Now, that is the reason why the shepherd's rod is plainly telling us that unless you connect the parable in Matthew 20 to Revelation 6 verse 6, you could never comprehend the parable in Matthew 20. Because the only answer is found in Revelation 6 verse 6. What does it mean? It's easy to understand, brothers and sisters, that let us distinctly separate the occurrence on earth and the occurrence in the heavenly sanctuary. So, in the heavenly sanctuary, first, it must apply the statement, you, they are standing all the day idle. But on the earthly sanctuary, that is about the 11th hour. Now, I would like to repeat again, brothers and sisters. The only way that you could understand, brothers and sisters, Matthew 20, verse 6 and 7, is to connect Revelation 6, verse 6. What is Revelation 6, verse 6? Let us read again, 2SR, 222. In our study of the seven seals, we receive for future explanation the following scripture. And I heard a voice in the midst of the poor beast say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. Revelation 6, verse 6. Again, we turn the reader's attention to the fact that the voice came from the throne. See chapter 5 verse 11. Where is the throne? Heavenly sanctuary. Then it says, therefore, the price of the cereals is fixed by the great judge. If we will be talking Revelation 5 verse 11, here is the admonition given in track number 8 
page 5. As a matter of fact, you can read in the upper portion, Revelation 5, verse 8, 11, and 12. So let us quote track number 8, page 5, quoting, And when he had taken the book, that is Revelation 5, verse 8, verse 11, and verse 12, track number 8, and then let us read the commentary, it says, the entire, then let's read the commentary, it says, The lamp standing at first before the throne in heaven stands later with 144,000 on Mount Zion. Upon earth, though the elders and the beasts round about the throne remain in heaven. Then it says, So correctly to understand this prophetic event in its entirety, we must carefully differentiate the part which takes place in heaven from the part which takes place on earth. Now, I would like to repeat again. According to 2SR 234, the parable in Matthew 20 never been understood by any other company except the 11 hour servants. So, in other words, since according to White House Reporter, page 28, the 11 hour servants are the 144,000. Our, our life, if we are among the 144,000, we're already guided by the words of inspiration what we will do or what we shall do in accordance with the description given in the Bible as explained by the chapter. All of them are standing idle all the day. That is very plain in Matthew 20 verse 6. So that verse cannot be understood unless you connect to the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary because Revelation 6 verse 6 is the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary. The voice came from the throne where in the most holy place. Revelation 6 verse 6. Whose voice? The voice of God the Father. So, in that instance, we are given the admonition in order to understand the entire truth of the parable, we need to connect to the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary. And let us distinctly separate the occurrence that takes place in the heavenly sanctuary and the occurrence that takes place on the earth. So, brothers and sisters, we can easily discern that the entire constituent of the 144,000, all of them pass a period of time by which there were standing all the day idle. All the day. It can be that some of them standing idle only four hours. Some of them six hours. No. All of them standing all the day idle. Not saying that they were lazy because they were, according to Anserer, I think he says that the, the 11 hour servants, no, they were industrious people. They, they were not lazy. So it's only pointing to the gospel ministry. They never been, all of them, they never been in the gospel ministry by which someone is hiring them, someone is paying them tithes and offerings, and that is the reason that they were working. No, all of them, the entire 144,000, all of them standing idle all the day. Therefore, we need to understand what period of time by which indicated in that statement in Matthew 20. Verse 6, that they were standing all the day idle. Remember, I would like to read to you here in White House Recruiter on page, uh, page 15. It says, The truth is now become clear that the parable divides the time of salvation into two equal parts of 12 symbolical hours each. The period before the Bible, the night, and the period during the Bible, the day. Lending additional force to the fact that the parable does divide time. Jesus declares, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk during the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. John 11 verse 9. I think everybody of us can understand the word equal. Let us define first uh, in the dictionary what does it mean by equal. For we are admonished by the shepherds one to observe the language. And inspiration never does anything vain or careless. I would like to read here in the old symbolic word. So what equal? It says being the same in quality, size, degree, value, or identical, uniform. So that, that's what it means by equal. For example, can you say that 3 and 2 are equal? No. 3 is greater than 2. Or 3 is more than, than 2. 2 is less than, than 3. That is not equal. If you will say 2 plus a 2 and 2, then that is equal. And since the statement says that the time of salvation is divided into two equal parts, 
12 hours in the daylight and or 12 hours 12 hours in the night time and 12 hours on the daylight that is equal and there is no other um, day by which the night time and the daylight are equal is the vernal equinox that is why of all the of all the signs uh, given by the shepherd's rod or given by the word of God, it is the vernal equinox by which such signpost is immovable. That is synonymous to the statement, God the Father fixed the price of the cereals because the word fix is synonymous to the term immovable. It could no longer be changed. Now let me read to you. Answerer number 3 on page 11. It says, And so it is the, the Passover, the atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, the three most important feasts in the year. Besides other feasts are controlled by the solar year and by the lunar month. The weekly Sabbath by the day in which creation began. The year itself by the vernal equinox, the immovable signpost. You see, brothers and sisters, what signpost which is immovable, fixed, it cannot be moved. The vernal equinox. And what is vernal equinox? The word equinox meaning equal. Here in Anzerer, although it is also divine in, in the dictionary, in Anzerer number 3, page 15, it says, uh, The time of the year, uh, I would like to read, it says, The vernal equinox, Although, bit what I've cited here, March 20 and 21, the vernal equinox of the Gregorian calendar. It says, the vernal equinox, the time of the year when the day and the night are equal. What is the vernal equinox? That is the day by which 12 hours, exactly 12 hours in the night time, exactly 12 hours on the daylight. And it never happened ever since, only in creation week. That April 1, 4000 BC, that is the only vernal equinox. That is why it is inscribed in singular form. So the term used by the, the world, the Gregorian calendar, that March 20 and 21 is vernal equinox, is erroneous. It cannot be called vernal equinox. The only term that can be used, supposed to be, must be spring equinox, not vernal. Because try to research, even from 31 ED up to this present day, there is no history that March 20 and 21, exactly the, the night time and the daylight are absolutely equal. No. If you will say that uh, sun will set on 6, uh, 6.02, then it could no longer be equal. Because equal must be sunset at 6 p.m., sunrise at 6 a.m. And it never happens ever since. Only happened once in the historical event, and that is in the creation week. Otherwise, the statement must be grammatically incorrect, saying immovable signpost, inscribed in singular form, and there is only one vernal equinox. Or in other words, the only true calendar is the calendar from April 1, 4000 BC onward, 360 days every year, 30 days to a month, 12 months in a year, 12 times 30 equals 360. From that calendar onwards, 360 days every year, is the only true calendar. And that signpost that had been placed by God in the creation week, Wednesday, the time when uh, the, the moon had been created, exactly at 6 p.m., the moon had been created. And then exactly at 6 a.m., the sun had been created, the first sunrise. And that is the time by which the night time and the daylight are absolutely equal. Only April 1, 4000 BC, the vernal equinox, that signpost which fixed by, by God, and that signpost is immovable. Now, let us go to the parable in Matthew 20. Brethren, it is a very important subject that we need to study, and it is concerning the experience of the 144,000. Or in other words, the statement, strive with all your power to be among the 144,000, 7 BC 970, is to know the description of the 144,000. And after knowing the description, then let us apply it into our lives in order to be among that special number. Now, one of the descriptions given in the Bible is that all of them are standing all the day idle. Therefore, we need to study what is the absolute significance the entire period symbolizes by 12 symbolical hours, by which symbolizing 24 hours, the time of salvation, represented by the figurative vernal equinox. 
12 hours in the night time and 12 hours on the daylight. And that event can never be understood unless we connect to the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary. So that is our next goal on our uh, next uh, episode, brothers and sisters, concerning that event. They were standing all the day idle. And we will show to you the beauty of the prophecy as recorded in the Bible and as explained by the shepherds. So, to repeat again, one of the experience by which the inter 144,000 has the same experience, they pass a period of time by which all of them, they have no shepherd. All of them scattered throughout the whole world without a shepherd. That is the description of the 144,000. But who are they the description to those who will say the harvest is past, the summer is ended? All of them who are under the leadership of many shepherds. But after the summer is ended, after the harvest is past, they will finally realize and they will be awakened to such spiritual insensibility. At last, they discovered that the shepherds whom they implicitly trusted for their salvation had deceived them, all who followed them. So that is not the description of the 144,000. It could not be said that the shepherds whom they implicitly trusted for their salvation, how could it say to the 144,000 while they have no shepherd? Ponder deeply, brothers and sisters. So the only shepherd that the 144,000 recognizes in that period of time is Jesus Christ, the true shepherd, the good shepherd. And they were scattered throughout the whole world without a shepherd. They were not belong to any denomination because if they belong to such denomination by which there is habitations, brothers and sisters, because that's in the description in Amos 1 verse 2, the habitations of shepherds. The only shepherd mentioned in the Bible that God will feed his people is David, antitypical David. And David at that time, according to the voice of inspiration, he is not residing on the palace. When David resides on the palace, Saul was already dead. So that historical event, who are the antitypical soul? The leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Rock number 8, page 47 and page 48. The leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, antitypical soul. Historically, when David already sitting on the throne, when, when David were already in the palace, at that time, Saul was already dead. Showing in the antitype. That before that time, when Saul was still alive, antitypical David has no headquarters. He has no palace because palace represents headquarters. So we'll continue that subject, brothers and sisters, and hoping that God would bless us and would help us. Thank you very much for listening and beautiful program. May the good Lord bless you and have a beautiful, wonderful.